How are you? It's nice to see you. Good. Um, I'm a little under the weather right now. I got a bit of a cold, so I might sound a little stuffy, but oh, no other than that, good. It's a bad time to, to catch a cold when you're just about to gear up to do a bunch of promotion, right? Yeah, I, it's it's been like two weeks. I don't know what's going on. My head is just stuffy. I think I'm actually going into the doctor. Are you still out in, in Washington? You still getting the, the good mountain yep. air and all that? Out in Woodenville, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I love it up here. It's a beautiful spot. I, I don't have a fully formed thought about like wellness and, and what we do, but it is one of those things where I think we ask a lot of our bodies doing this kind mm -hmm. of thing in terms of just like no sleep and late nights and, you know, drinking or partying or whatever indulgences people might have. And uh, every once in a while, man, the, the body takes a little back. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like when I'm home now, I don't drink at home and I'm very like eat the same thing every day and trying to be as healthy as possible as if somehow it's going to like make up for all the <laughs> lack of sleep and, you know, shenanigans on the road. I don't know if it really will, but I definitely, the older I get, the more conscious of that I am for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Cause I mean, when you start, like if you think about when you started first really touring heavy, when everything was taking off and all that, I mean, were you thinking at all about how to take care of yourself and how to make it sustainable? Uh, like longevity was not the goal in the beginning. You know, I feel like some of those tours we did, like the World's Apart tour was like really, really intense. And like the first bus tour, all that stuff was like, I just didn't know how mentally and physically taxing it would be. Yeah. But I don't know. It's just a learning thing. Now, when I talk to my agent about like booking shows, I'm like, okay, I want to get there the day before. I want to make sure the routing is good. Um, like this, this year we actually had a, um, a weekend where we had a show in Miami for the Ophelia showcase. And then the next night was in LA for like beyond. And then the night after that was back in Miami. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, I hadn't done anything like that in many years. And I like, I met my agent in Miami and I was just like, dude, this is it. Like, I'm not, not doing it anymore. There's like no, no amount of, um, you know, money or just, you know, importantness of the shows is going to get me to like do another no sleeping kind of thing for three days. Dude. It's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And that is one of those things I think that only comes with experience. I've told this story on the podcast a couple of times before, but I'll just very quickly share with you, which is the first time I went to Australia completely randomly, I sat next to Paul Oakenfold. No, no reason. Just happened to be sitting it's next crazy. to him. And yeah. uh, we were talking just a tiny bit very nice dude. And I, I was just telling him, I was like, yeah, I've never been to Australia. I'm excited, blah, blah, blah. And he immediately started grilling me about the routing of the tour. And then immediately just started kind of like berating me for having a bad routing. And it was, yeah. at the time it was very odd. And I was like, this is a weird thing to talk to you about. But then looking back, I was like, oh, he was right. That routing sucked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's worth it to pay attention to that stuff because if you want to do it for a long time, you got to actually pay attention. Yes. Yeah. Burnout is a real thing for sure. Well, I mean, so you said uh, when you started touring that you weren't thinking about longevity or that it wasn't even the goal. When did it no. when did that change or has that changed? Um, I I don't know. I feel like around 2016, 2017 is when I started realizing I'm going to be doing this for a while. And then especially 2020, like right before the pandemic, I feel like, you know, this definitely started to feel like this isn't just like a little break from my day job. This is going to be something that I'm going to be doing for a long time. You know, as Ophelia started to grow and um, all these other very sustainable long-term career things started to take shape. It was just like, all right, this is my life now. And I need to like get it together because I can't, just tour in an unsustainable way and expect to be doing this when I'm 40, you know? Yeah. And I'm 35 now. So it's like, you know, not too long. So <laughs> yeah, I gotta, I gotta get it together, which I have been, I feel good about it. It's just, I, I'd say the hardest thing would be like with 
touring is not being able to cook for myself. I feel like I like to eat well and, you know, room service and things like that and feeling like I can't, you know, treat my body the way I want it as far as what I eat. Yeah, That's kind of become something that's a bummer. But other than that, you know, I feel like I can manage it pretty well. What, uh, are, are you vegan, vegetarian? You have like a specific mm-hmm. diet, the opposite? <laughs> no, no, the opposite. Yeah. No, I just like, I'm so since my life is so chaotic, most of the time, I'm one of those people who really relies on, um, ritual and, uh, doing the same thing every day. If I can, I kind of like have ritualized my whole day. So it's like, these are steadfast things that I do. Yeah. And it keeps me really grounded. Like I have the same tea every morning you know, the same, it's just the same routine and it really helps a lot. So when I'm on the road, I, I miss that a lot for sure. Yeah. I, I get that, man. Cause it's being on the road already, you sort of feel like an alien to a certain extent or, or like just yeah. a, a visitor in everybody else's lives. It's kind of hard to feel Ooh. like you're, you're having your own life. Yeah. It's, it's weird when you start to feel like that at home though. That's like, <laughs> yeah. cause I feel like that in Woodenville sometimes, like I live in a community where, um, it's a lot of retired people. It's the city is growing now. So there are some younger people, but generally it's older people. And like, we don't belong here in a way, you know, with our lifestyle, it's, I think it's, you know, especially being with Emma and Courtney and just the three of us being who we are in this, you know, little town it's definitely like an interesting um it's an interesting place uh, yeah i mean do you feel uh, i would imagine at least at first you get maybe some weird stares from the older people that kind of thing do you have you integrated at this point i i would imagine like you know the people around you to a certain extent no okay <laughs> <laughs> i mean i think we've integrated as much as we can like we don't uh, I mean, like I, I know the people at the grocery store, I run into some people on the walk that I do every day, but like, really, this is just a place to like live. And I'm not really attached to the community so much, I sure. guess, but. Well, I mean, yeah, you're there I, for what, the, the nature, the, the yeah. vibe of it basically. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. All my friends are on the road, really. Like all my, my closest friends are all the Ophelia guys and we talk every day. Thank God for like WhatsApp because we like talk all the time. But like my, my friends are definitely on the road when I'm touring. Yeah. I was just talking to some old high school friends about that of, you know, what do you really need at this point in life from a friendship? And yeah, some of my friends, uh, you know, who don't do music, just like regular kind of desk job thing. They're like, yeah, you know, I see my family and I talk to, to you guys online and some other friends online, but it's like, yeah, a lot of the friendships just are online unless it's, mm. you know, a special trip to visit somebody or in our case, going on tour with our friends, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. I don't know. I I go back and forth for myself because I think uh, like you, I'm I'm a pretty introverted dude. Like I don't need to be around people all the time. And sometimes that's exhausting. But then every mm-hmm. once in a while when I am, I'm like, oh, yeah, there's a reason that you're supposed to do this, this, you know, this does feel good. This is good for the yeah. soul. Yeah. I noticed that when we went back to Santa Barbara, um, for our anniversary and I, I hung out with a bunch of old friends and it, that place definitely has more of a community. Like we're in just people locally that I really like in Santa Barbara. So I think maybe one of these days we might move or at least get a place over there just to like split time. I'm sure. not sure, but. Well, I do like it over there. It's beautiful out there too, man. That's a nice mm-hmm. place. So you mentioned Ophelia a second ago, and I was I was listening back to the first podcast we did in 2017. You had kind of been just hinting about that. I think what you were hinting about was that you were thinking about making Ophelia Records, which is crazy to think about because at this point, I, I mean, it's turned into such a such a monster of a thing. Um, yeah. Uh, but that's a short time when I think about it. It's less than five years old or about five years old, something like that, right? I think this space really needed something to rally around, you know, like the melodic bass music kind of thing. And I feel like it was, um, I mean, we've put a lot of effort and energy into making it like very high quality and set 
a high bar. So I feel like it has been able to do really well in that sense. And I, a lot of what Ophelia, like the mindset going in for me was like community building and how do we really make a community that people identify with and want to be a part of, you know, cause I feel like that's really what makes a genre a long-term, you know, important thing in people's lives. It's something that they, they love the music, but they connect with the culture and the community and it means something. So I think that's really kind of the ethos behind Ophelia. And also I feel like the, the people that I work with, the artists on Ophelia, we're all such good friends that we embody that ourselves. So it seems to really like be a genuine you know, community, which is really cool. Yeah, man. I've had a, a bunch of those people on this show over time. You know, Jake's been on mm -hmm. a few times and Trivecta and, and a bunch of people. And everybody basically says that same thing. The word family comes up a lot. And when you were starting it, or even when you're in the middle of it and trying to build it into this sort of community-minded entity, is there anything you can point to that you did differently or things you saw other labels not doing that kind of go into building that? Cause that's, you know, when you say it, it's like, obviously, yes, that's a good idea to make a community based label, but I think it's a harder thing to make real, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if there was a specific thing that we did. I think it became pretty natural. There was, um, basically a, a while ago, I decided to try and, you know, make a WhatsApp group so everybody could talk on the label and, um, it started off really quiet and people weren't talking very much. It was just the idea, you know, we would all talk about collabs and see what happens. Yeah. And then, um, the pandemic hit and then we all just really started relying on each other and talking every day. And it just became a really like we all relied on each other, you know? So I feel like that kind of is what brought us all together is like that part of the family. But as far as the wider Ophelia community, I just, I feel like there was a big like need for that because melodic bass, I feel like it, it didn't have anything like that. There was no like yeah. flag to rally around and it just seemed like it was kind of the right, the right thing for the moment. I don't think it ever was like, that never was the original idea behind Ophelia. It was just for me to like have a label to release my own music on. Cause I didn't want to work with major record labels basically. Yeah. And then I think looking at Anjuna specifically was something like, all right, they're doing it right. They're building a community. They understand that like the fans are what drive this. And the, the value in a record label is having a record label that I can like, see an artist and be like, I like this. So I'm going to put this on the record label. And there's people who like, they, they know whatever is on the record label is going to be good. So they're going to give it a chance. And like, yeah, I think that's where, I mean, that's kind of the whole goal of the record label. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like building a, a friendship or a, a human relationship, right? Where the, you, there's got to be trust involved in it. And it's not so much about hype or transactional or, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Where For sure. Yeah, more of a more of a long term idea, which which makes sense. And I think the fact that all of you guys are friends comes through very strongly. I, I talked to a lot of people about that group chat that yeah. <laughs> that you were talking about, and I, I think that makes people want to be a part of it too, because it does just sort of feel like hanging out with friends rather than yeah. you know just being a, a fan of something, which can I think sometimes. Sometimes being a fan can be fun, but I think, you know, feeling like you can participate is is a different mm -hmm. thing. For sure. It definitely is. Yeah. 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 I mean, during the pandemic, we were all FaceTiming and streaming a lot and all that stuff was pretty cool. But yeah. Yeah. No, there were, there were definitely a bunch of silver linings, man. I mean, another silver lining, I would assume, is the, the Beyond the Veil album. I would imagine definitely. a lot of that started taking form during the pandemic. Yeah, for sure. Um, especially, yeah, I mean, I just don't think I would have had time to do it, you know, like with the touring, it just felt like I had been asked about doing an album before and I was always just like, it doesn't make sense. There's just no time to like, if I was to do an album, 
I wouldn't release music for like two or three years and people would be really upset about that. <laughs> so I finally had time to, you know, just focus on making music like I used to, like back before I was touring and it was really awesome. Yeah. I mean, did it, uh, did you approach the writing other than just being in the pandemic and not being on tour and all that? Did it feel different than how you had been writing before then? Yeah. I mean, there's always pressure to like, and it's, you know, self pressure, but to like make tracks that are going to do well in a live situation. And especially up into like 2019, 2020, I was very focused on big tracks that, you know, people could dance to be good to play at a festival, which those tracks, you know, they have to have a certain amount of energy and a certain amount of predictability. Yeah. And, um, because of the pandemic, I felt like I got to do songs that weren't like that necessarily. Um, not to say that there aren't any, you know, bigger festival tracks on the album, but I actually got the time to really focus on tracks that I knew that I know that I'll never play, you know, which I don't think I would have given the time on those songs if I was still touring essentially. Mm. Yeah. You know? No, that makes, that makes total sense, man. That, in a way, I'd imagine that's got to feel very nice or very freeing in that, you know, I think we I all it. sort of put ourselves in in certain boxes or in certain frameworks of what what would be smart to do as an artist, you know, versus like just letting creativity flow freely. And mm -hmm. I think everyone ends up sort of somewhere in the middle of those two ideas. But uh, yeah. yeah, man, that's, that's nice. I mean, do you... Do you think things you learned making this album will be things you take with you going forward? Like, do you think you're changing the way you work a little? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I would love to have enough time to do this again, but I don't know if that's really going to happen for a long time. <laughs> um, I think now, right now that I'm done with the album, it's just time to do a lot of collabs, a lot of big crowd pleasers, you know, um, I'm also working on some stuff for Emma and Courtney, Gem and Tori, which has been a lot of fun doing house music. Just, um, it's cool. Cause I can knock out one of those tracks in like three or four sessions where, you know, my songs are like months right. and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of detail. Um, and collabs are always fun too. It's, it's an interesting thing. Um, deciding who to collab with and like, um, yeah, that's been a, a, a cool process getting back into, cause I haven't done a collab for a while. The album was, I really wanted it to be just my production. Um, that was like really important. I feel like for what I wanted to do with it. So it's yeah. Opening it back up again will be cool. Well, yeah, I saw some quote about, uh, from a different interview you did about the album that was talking about the, you know, why it was important to you to just be, you know, no collabs, like all solo tracks, that kind of thing. And you were saying, so I wanted to ask you, you were saying something about how it's sort of harder for artists to feel like they have their own identity in, in the modern era. It, you, it, not exactly in those words, but it was, Basically something, it sounded like you kind of wanted to like put your stamp back on your project. I f feel like where, you know, a lot of dubstep is kind of going, there's a um, homogenization happening, you know, where there is a sound and it's very clear what it is. And um, there's, I hate to say it, there's a lot of, you know, shenanigans, a lot of ghost producing and a lot of people who don't even really have a sound their sound is collaborations sure. or, you know, whatever works for them, that's fine. But like, I really wanted to show what I do and really, um, yeah, put a stamp on it and be like, this is, you know, from start to finish something that I made a story that I wanted to tell, you know, even all the artwork, everything was very planned and very, um, involved. And I'm like really proud of that. And I feel like I had the time to do it and I wanted to do it. And I'm really stoked on that. But yeah, it, it just felt like the time, especially with just the current state of where things are right now. It just I felt like I needed to like step up and be like, this is 
my project and this is what I want to say. Mm. So I love that. And, and I mean, it's got to be, it's funny hearing you say that because it's got to be weird for you in that, yeah, there's a lot of melodic bass music and a lot of melodic dubstep in the world in 2022. Yeah. And when you started, that was certainly not the case. I mean, no, I, I remember talking to you about, you know, even the idea of combining, you know, say, trance aesthetics with dubstep got a lot of pushback early totally. early on i mean it, it, how is that odd for you because it's got to feel good and weird right to like be like i was right this was a good idea and i can help like flourish these ideas but then also yeah now there's a lot of noise to cut through and a lot of kind of you know, yeah. people doing it for different that's reasons. That's a big question because there's a lot to unpack there because yeah. that's something I've thought about a lot, but also something that I've tried to like not think about because it's not super healthy sometimes. Sure. Um, I'd say in 2016, 2017 is there was a lot of other people coming on board. 2018, I think it did bother me a little bit to see like kind of like the cheesy, easy versions of it become popular, like to watch... I don't know what I thought is like somebody kind of take what I was doing, make it more poppy, make it less complicated. And that was definitely a little tough, I'd say for a little while, but I'm, I'm really happy with what I do. And I feel like I can't like their success doesn't take anything away from me. Even if they might be influenced by me, it's fine. And if they're, even if they're not, it's fine. It doesn't matter. But I got to it like a good space about it because there were times where I was definitely like, you know, frustrated, but also, you know, it's not worth losing sleep over. And I, I really do love what I do. And I feel like this is a blessing. And like, I never thought that I would get this far anyways. So I can't, you know, be mad. I'm just happy to get to have this opportunity. So, yeah, I mean... And now I don't, I really don't think about that stuff too much other than like I was saying, I, I do see a lot of like bullshittery and it felt like I needed to step up. And if I'm not going to say anything on Twitter, cause I'm not that guy, I'm going to say something with my music and just be like, you know, this is what, this is what it is, I guess. So. Which is interesting. Cause even, so even before we had this conversation we're having right now, or before I read that in the interview, I was listening to the album and the the opening track, the one with uh, Vancouver Sleep Clinic, um, mm -hmm. or I guess the, the yeah. second track on the record, um, mm -hmm. really felt to me, man, like it was, it, it kind of felt like a flex a little bit. I thought it was really, really great choice to sort of open the album. And I don't know, there was... The, there's little things in that track. And by the time this comes out, people will have the album. They'll hopefully know what we're talking about. But uh, th yeah, little things like just, you know, it was all the, the melodic dubstep like hallmarks. And then you would sort of flex on top of that, you know, with like yep. a crazy chord change or something goes out of tune for a minute or something gets sort of crazily distorted in an un unexpected way. Like all the little touches I don't know, man, for, for whatever reason, it actually did kind of feel like that to me of being like, you know, just a reminder of Thank like, you. Hey guys, I'm, I'm here. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. That's cool. I appreciate that. Yeah. It just felt important at this time to do that for sure. Plus it's fun. I mean, I love making music. It's what I love to do. I think, um, a big part of why I step away from social media and that kind of stuff to just focus on music is because I can't identify with a lot of the, the whole Twitter and social media thing anymore, because I feel like when artists get called out, um, for ghost production or whatever, I see people on Twitter saying things like, um, of course they're ghost produced. It's not possible to tour and make your own music. <laughs> and I feel like those, like, that's like the most invalidating shitty thing that I've ever seen on Twitter or on Instagram or whatever. And it just like, I think I just had to like step back after that and be like, I, I can't like, I don't want to be, you know, thinking about that kind of stuff all the time and like frustrated by the fact that people know, but don't care, you know? So yeah, I think, yeah, that definitely was like a, 
I'm just going to step back, focus on music, focus on my friends, focus on my family. And I've been really happy and I feel like it's allowed me to like step up and make an album that I'm really proud of. And um, yeah. Well, I mean, even, even when we talked in 2017, you were talking about kind of similar themes of, you know, stepping back from social media or at least wanting to. And it's interesting. The only reason I want to talk about this is just because I think there's a lot of pressure on up and coming artists, uh, or at least they're being told that you have to be on all the time. You have to be posting all the time. It's all about content, you know, and that like you have to do it. And, And you, I think, have had a pretty healthy attitude or at least an awareness about social media from the early days until now. I mean, if you look back at sort of where you started and where you are now, do you have any wisdom? Is there anything you can point to as far as like how to exist on social media without getting, you know, really swept up in it or without sacrificing your art or your happiness in it? (laughs) Um, That's, well... I guess I had some pressure to be more social in the beginning. And I feel like I was a little bit like I was more engaging on Twitter back in the day. And I'm sure it helped. I know it helped. And when I'm on tour, I do more Instagram stories and I try and be more, um, show people who I am. Um, and I think, you know, being genuine is the way to do it. It's not always the way to success. Like I am not a, Instagram personality or an influencer. And the things that I like are probably not what (laughs) people give a shit about. Like I did a a TikTok about me going antiquing with Emma and Courtney (laughs) because like literally my house is full of antiques. I like antiques. And it, you know, went over like a turd in a punch bowl. Like it just was not (laughs) a thing. And that's fine. You know, it's, it's okay. But, um, that was my little foray into TikTok, and I, I didn't, it didn't stick. And I'm like, I'm okay with it. It's just, um, I've been doing these videos where I'll talk, um, like when I'm on a walk. Um, and I feel like that's cool. Cause during the pandemic, I got used to talking a little more and being on stream, you know, yeah. doing that kind of thing. And that helps. So like, I'll do like an update every month and just kind of chat and say, Hey, you know, this is how things are going. But um, other than that, I really stay off of social media. Um, my Instagram, all I follow is my friends and some tattoo artists and some sci-fi art and things like that. So um, I don't really have any advice on how to grow social media wise, because that's never been my thing. My advice would be more along the lines of like how to keep your sanity which is being conscious of what you are consuming media wise like who you're following you know if you go because everybody does this shit you can you know be scrolling and you see like something that makes you like oh like somebody has this all the success and you're like oh why don't i have that and you have this like negative feeling all you got to do is be like mute and then that's it and then just keep going like just being aware of like And it doesn't make you a bad person. It's just like, I don't, you know, it just makes you aware of like what, what you're bringing into your space. Like if you, if it, if following certain people on Instagram or Twitter, if it makes you feel bad, then don't do it or just don't be on it and just be aware of that. Because like, if you're not, I feel like it can lead to a lot of really crippling, you know, feelings of, Uh, And like a creativity block, you know, all kinds of just bad things. So I would just say, be aware, be conscious of what you're consuming media wise. I see it with my friends too. Some of my friends are way attached to social media. I'm like, yo, why are you paying attention to this? Like who gives a shit? This is not making your day any better, you know, like, but it's just, yeah, is what it is. Yeah. Well, it's addictive, right? I mean, it's designed to be addictive. So I think, yeah, some people just kind of get that low level addiction. And I mean, certainly mm-hmm. I probably have that low level, you know, we all do to some extent and it's kind mm-hmm. of, yeah, like you said, realizing that it is an addiction and that it's not necessarily healthy and just trying to, for sure. Yeah. Trying to engage when it's, when it's useful or when it's fun. That's basically 
yeah the only times when it's fun for sure i'd say when it feels important or like you it's worth having something to say because so much of it just feels like shenanigans and not worth it and i i think when i finally unfollowed a lot of people and at least follow them but mute them so i'm not seeing stuff all the time it allows me to like kind of exist in my own little world and be creative on my own terms and um focus on what's important like you know truly you know my my family and my animals and like I don't think about what other people are doing because I I just don't see it and it's been really like helpful you know yeah man absolutely and and that's yeah that's what's important man I think too like you were saying you know you follow like sci-fi art people and that maybe the antiquing didn't go over on TikTok. Like I, it makes me think about the idea too, that it, I think it's good to just have some stuff for yourself. You know, it's like, obviously we all want to put ourselves out there to some extent on social media. It helps to connect with people, that kind of thing. And it can be fun. But as I've gotten older, I've also realized that like some of my interests, it's actually more rewarding for me to kind of just have like a private thing that's like my thing you know because that when i think back to being a kid everything was like that you know it was all kind of just these things that i was passionate about that i would follow without really thinking about what it meant and i'm kind of coming back to that as i get older of just having some Mm -hmm. some weird stuff that i like whether it's you know antiquing for you or you know, like I, I play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons and like that kind of, nice. you know, all that kind of thing. Yeah. It could be anything, but it's mm-hmm. uh, it feels good to have something that's kind of just your own. And I don't think like there's the there's a myth, especially for artists now where everything has to be content. And I think I feel mm-hmm. like that's unhealthy. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, it depends on the person. But for me, that's deeply unhealthy for sure. And I'm just not that person because I just... I don't feel like, I don't know, my brain doesn't work that way. And then seeking approval, seeking likes on like a post or was that funny enough? Or am I coming off cool? Or like, am I relatable? Like, I just don't want that shit in my head. So I just don't play that game, you know? Well, what was, uh, as long as we're talking about the the nerdy interests, uh, I mean, obviously, like you talking about following sci-fi artists, you talked mm-hmm. earlier about the art concepts behind beyond the veil. Um, like yeah. what, what kind of nerdery are we talking about? Like what, oh, what do you really um, nerd out about? I mean, I'm definitely a big video gamer. People know that like Elden Ring, you know, I, I spent like 300 hours on it when it first <laughs> came out. Um, and that was like in the middle of working on my album. So it was actually really fun to be bouncing back and right. forth. Um, I'm really into, I've been watching a lot of Mystery Science Theater 3000 lately. Oh, that's a good so one. I like a lot of movies, um, bad sci-fi movies. I really like um, horror movies, um, antiquing, obviously. Um, I got into watch collecting briefly, but then decided that wasn't really my thing. Oh, interesting. Um, what, what was the watch collecting thing? Like what? Because I know people who nerd out about that, but I'd be I'm actually curious to know, like, what's cool about it to you? Like, what's the what's the hook to get you into watch collecting? Um, I only like automatic watches. So I think the idea that um, like a little tiny mechanical um, thing that like can keep time automatically, the ones with the self winders. Um, so just. I like traditional automatic watches, I guess, because it felt connected to old world stuff. Mm. And I find it amazing that that technology was around um, back when it was. And I don't know, I guess I I got into that aspect of it. And like the really astrological, um, really beautiful, detailed watches I was into. But I also was like, this is not a sustainable (laughs) collecting thing. Like, I don't want to be spending a ton of money on something that's just, you know, it's just... So, Cause, yeah, yeah, they that, go. I that. mean, it can get expensive, right? When you get oh, yeah. really into it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what else? Nerd wise. I don't know. I feel like Mystery Science Theater 3000 That's is definitely my mega nerd thing right now. That's a good um, one, man. Do, are you are you going back and watching all the classics or are you do you keep up to date? Because they're still making it, right? 
Yeah, I, I joined their their new thing. Um, it's not on Netflix anymore. It's like you have to have the app. Right. And I, I downloaded it and have been watching that. But um, yeah, I'm running it. I think I'm back on season three right now. So nice, man. basically, Emma and Courtney have started touring a lot. So I have a lot of time at home alone. <laughs> right. So like, um, it's just a really good thing to put on in the background. So I'm here with the dogs and the cat and just, you know, working on music watching mystery science theater hanging out it's pretty chill i mean it's interesting talking about like uh like emma and courtney too you know they're touring now as as gem and tori am i saying that right tori yeah. okay good gem and tori. Yeah, yeah 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 what has that process been of you know like because i know obviously you and emma have been married a long time we talked a little bit last time about when she first quit her job and started touring with you and got involved with the the business of it. And I always thought it was very cool that you were sort of running not just Ophelia, but like the whole thing. It's like a family business, like kind of in the yeah. old school way. Uh, what, what has that process been? You know, you were talking about working with them on music as well. Uh, how is how has that evolution been? Um, I basically before the pandemic, there was like some opening time slots that, um, you know, there was nobody in, I think mission ballroom was like the first one and Emma and Courtney both know how to DJ. So I was just like, yo, you know, you guys go check it out and get up there. And they went up and DJed and they didn't even have a project yet. Um, and it went off and during the pandemic, we spent a lot of time doing the live streams and I'm like not very comfortable in front of a camera and like talking. Yeah. Um, so they were there to like, well, not just to help me out, but just because we were hanging out a lot and it was like, we were in my studio, didn't have anything else to do other than party and DJ. So we were just kind of like doing that. And um, then we started making music and it just kind of became like a thing and started to solidify into Gem and Tori and um yeah, we did the brunches a lot. I feel like that was a big thing that really like um, showed everybody who they were, you know, because they actually have been able to like really get pretty far pretty quickly, I think, because people feel connected to them through all the live streams mm. and stuff. And um, yeah, the process has been great. I sit here and they, they pull up a chair and we work on music. And um, it's cool because for me making house music is a lot of fun cause it's a different, uh, it's a different genre. It's a different process and it's a lot less finicky and like detailed in a way. It just, it's more about a groove, you know? Yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, I don't I just like it. It's, it's been great. I've been, um, we've been remixing a album song, actually miss you that I think we're going to put out in like December doing fun stuff. I've been working on like some, I think hopefully an EP for them. And that's great, man. Yeah. It's got to feel nice too. I mean, just in a way, like there's no, I don't mean this in a negative way, but I'm sure when you're making music with Gem and Tori, it's like, there's none of the seven lions baggage attached to it, you know? So you're not thinking about necessarily like how this fits in with the canon yeah. and the last 10 years of releases and all that kind of thing. Totally. I feel like I've kind of been all over the place with that too, though. So I, even when I make music as Seven Lions, it doesn't really feel like I have much of a mold to fit in. If I mean, I have a, a lane, obviously, but I, I feel like I've, you know, kind of my fans know me well enough to like, I'm going to do whatever I want, which they've been graceful enough to allow me to do whatever I want and not really give me blowback anymore. I feel like in the beginning it was a little different, but like I'm lucky to have you know, people who don't put me into a box, which is nice. Absolutely, um, man. But yeah. With, with Jim and Tori too, I feel like, um, they started traveling with me a lot. I mean, Emma's been traveling with me for forever, but Courtney as well. And it gives us focus. Like now they have a reason to be traveling with me and like, they're not just there for, you know, emotional and mental support they're there to play a show and now i get to play the role of emotional and mental right. support and it's actually been um really really good for our relationship because they understand me a lot better and i get to support them 
in a way that I understand because like I've been through it. So it's been um, like really, really good for us. And I think um, Emma respects me in a different way and I respect her in a different way. Mm. So it's, and Courtney, it's just been a, a really good experience. That's beautiful, man. I mean, that that was going to be my next question basically was, you know, how do you balance sort of the work life separation if there is a separation at all at this point um no we're pretty good at it like saturday we just did no music stuff we just like watched a bunch of horror movies emma made some soup you know we just like did our romantic fall thing and then yesterday was all working on music so like um working on music getting them ready for groove cruise um they ran over their set and were like freestyling in here while I was like playing video games. And, um, it's cool. We have a very good, like we can separate when we need to, like if we're like, all right, today we're doing something totally different. We'll go do fun stuff. Right. Um, not that music isn't fun, but like we do get to separate. And that's the thing too. Like we all love what we do. Like I love making music and you know, they like making music. So it's the fun, the fun part is the work part as well. So it it works out. Yeah. I mean, do you think at this point, like, uh, you know, I know you put out the, the 10 years of seven lions kind of compilation Mm -hmm. thing and, and you've been doing this for a while is my point. What is, what is the drive that keeps you here at this point? Is it just still the love of creation? Is it, is it that you've kind of gotten farther than you initially thought you would? And now it's like, well, let's see what more we can do. Is it because I think of you as generally a pretty grounded person. It doesn't seem like you have the the disease, uh, the the ego disease as far as like, you know, I just need to stay famous as long as possible that I think a lot of people have. Like, what what is it for you, if you know? Um, I just really like making music, and I feel like I always will, regardless of, you know, whatever. I've been making music since, I mean, definitely middle school. I started my first band. So it's just something that I do, and I think I'll always do just because I like it, you know? Um, and starting new projects is always fun. I don't know. It's just my thing, and it... I like the alone time and the solitude and the creativity and the process of it all. I feel like it's what I'm good at. And I think people generally like to do what they're good at. And it just feels like, I don't know. I mean, my dad's a musician. He still plays in a band. He's I think 72 or something. Oh, that's great. Um, So I think it's part of the family. You know, my grandpa also played piano. I think I always will, even if I wasn't Seven Lions and completely fell off the face of the planet with that project, I would still be making music. Beautiful, man. I mean, it's funny because I've thought about this too, just as I get older and all the other DJs I know get older. It's like, I wonder what, if there is a cutoff age for any of this, because obviously there have been generations of DJs before us, some of whom are still going, but I feel like the in the EDM era, like you know, this is this is the first generation of EDM DJs who are starting to get a little older, mm. and I kind of wonder, you know, it, like it'd be fun if if you were still doing Seven Lines at seventy two, you know. I think I will. I just don't think I'll be sounding like I am now for sure. I feel like Opeth <laughs> yeah. is kind of the perfect example of a band that has kind of um, changed their sound, and I've kind of aged with them. Um, I don't know if you know much about Opeth, but they're, you know, we're heavy, like death, progressive metal kind of mixture. And they've right. just kind of, as they've gotten older, have, the death metal has slowly creeped out and they've just kind of kept um, the progressive metal, more of a rock, 70s rock kind of vibe almost. And at first I didn't like it. I was like, man, I want their, the metal back. But the older that I got, I was like, okay, I kind of like get what's happening here and I'm actually really digging it. So I think, you know, I'll, I'll probably always do seven lines. And I, I just imagine my sound might change over time. And I hope, you know, the fans will decide to come with me and some of them, I'm sure they won't. And that's fine. Um, 
but I know it. I mean, I, I don't see myself doing anything else at this point. I just, you know, I like what I do. I like make, making music. I might not tour forever. Touring is not a huge passion of mine. Um, yeah. I don't hate it. Like, like I said, I get to see my friends on the road, which is really nice, but um, I don't know how long I will continue to tour. I definitely see it in the, the near future, but I, I, I don't yeah. know if at like 45, 50, I'm going to be touring. I, I might though, <laughs> who knows? I don't know. Um, yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to put a, a rule on it necessarily. Yeah. I, I mean, do you have a vision for, and I apologize because this is a shitty question to ask someone who is just about to put out an album, but mm -hmm. it, it, looking like further into the future, do you have ideas for where you want to take the project? Like thing, either things you haven't done yet or, you know, styles or sounds you haven't tried or, or even something more conceptual? Yeah, definitely. I feel like some of the more mellow tunes on the album Between and um, Never Learn specifically are, are songs that I could see myself really eventually doing a full album that sounds like that. Essentially, like the complexity of what I'm known for, which is what I really enjoy, but like a completely different sound palette, something more organic and... Um, that I think would be the next step much further down the, the line. Maybe when I'm done sure. touring or something like that, because I really enjoyed making those songs. That's cool though. That's like, it's nice to have something to look forward to in a way too, right? Yeah. Especially something for like sure. you can be excited about for years and then finally get to do. I mean, I think about the, the, uh, the Opus album that you put out too, the like orchestral arrangements of all your songs I mean, that must have been fun to do. I feel like most people don't get to do that yeah, for what we do. Totally. Yeah, working with Atlas is amazing. Um, Ari Fisher specifically is like a fantastic composer and he can like take any idea that I have and like really flesh it out into something that sounds amazing within like a, a quartet. So, um, and he's uh, did, did a few things on the album. There's I think three or four songs that have um, Atlas in there. Okay. Yeah. And did you, uh, you haven't done any performances with that, right? Like orchestral performances? Uh, they came out to Red Rocks actually, and they okay. kind of did a little 30 minute slot. And then they were doing like in between each artist, they would come out and do one song, uh, which was really cool. And then they kind of like did the intro for my set. So, yeah. Oh, nice, that's man. Cool. That's, that's cool. Yeah. It'd be fun. I mean, listening to your music, which is obviously so, so cinematic and, and orchestral already, or at least like orchestral influenced. Uh, yeah. That kind of live performance aspect always also seems like something that you could really dig into if you wanted to. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I would like to explore that stuff more. I'm, I'm just happy I had the time to do it for beyond the veil, but as I saw Opeth do it, I always refer to them because they're like my favorite band. You know, they yeah. had their heavier tracks and they had these more mellow ones interspersed. And then eventually those mellow ones kind of just became the main thing. So, you know, I, I have a long time, I think, until that becomes a thing. But I I do definitely see, you know, if I do another album, it would be cool to do it all very like mellow, organic kind of album one of these days. That'll be a while. That'd be fun. Yeah, that'd be fun, man. But yeah, I mean, in the meantime, obviously, you just you just put out your first album. So you got plenty of time. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, I think the next thing now is just kind of like collaborating with some people and making some some bangers for the tour. You know, you got to make some bangers, yeah, man. For sure. Yeah. Which is still fun. I mean, it's, it's nice too to like, yeah, I was going to say, like, it's got to be fun to come back to it, too. Sometimes you just got to you can get fatigued from feeling like all you have to make is bangers, but then coming back to it, it's like, Oh yeah, bangers are, are great. Totally. <laughs> there is something fun about like putting together a track and being like, Oh man, this is going to slap live for sure. And then playing it and be like, I was right. You know, yeah. that's definitely fun. <laughs> um, yeah. It's like a, it's like a game in a way, you know, where you're not necessarily trying to, to communicate anything in particular, trying to make like, a, a meaningful like a resonating piece of art as much as 
trying to sort of connect with people on like an instinctual level, which is its own art and its own yeah. sort of craft. Yeah, I mean, it's a balance. You got to make something predictable enough to where people are going to feel like they can let loose to it. And also unpredictable enough that they're not completely bored or like, oh, wow, that's exactly what I thought it would be. So, yeah, it's definitely yeah. a fun, fun challenge. And people who can do that all the time make nothing but bangers. That's that's wild. I I I couldn't do that is my full bread and butter thing, you know? Yeah, man. Uh, is there anything else about the album we should talk about? I mean, there's you got so many great like vo- vocal features on there. Gigi McGree and Miha and Lights and yeah. Is there anything else you want to say about it? Anything else that like sticks out to you when you think about the the process of making it, the the art, the concept behind it? Um, I don't know. I think a lot of it is there for people who want to see it. You know, it's. I feel like it comes off as like a very personal thing because it is a very personal thing, and I'm sure you could listen to it and not really get the depth or, you know, maybe not depth, but like everything that I'm trying to say with it. But I feel like it's a complete package for those who want to dig into it. You know, I don't know how much I need to say about it other than just, you know, listen to it and I hope you enjoy it. That works, man. I mean, the, the, the concept of, you know, like beyond the veil, sort of the, the life and death, like duality and what happens afterwards and where do we go and all that kind of thing. Endlessly fascinating. Another great thing to nerd out about do you i'll just ask this one question then we can stop talking about it but for you personally what what happens when we die do you think um so i don't know you know i will know yeah everybody will once we get there Um, (laughs) once you know then you can't tell us yeah i know (laughs) so i don't i don't actually spend too much time thinking about it i think it uh in a much like, I don't, at least not thinking about it as in a, I never think about it in the sense that I will know before I get there because there's no way to know. Yeah. So I, I guess I don't see it in that kind of thing of like, I'm guessing it's more of just this, you know, like a wall that you can't look past. And then it's just, I don't know. It's a mystery. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's something like there is something out there afterwards? I don't know. I go back and forth. I mean, sometimes I feel like, you know, music can feel like a a spiritual thing and you can feel like you're connected to something bigger, but also it could just be chemicals running around in our brain telling us to feel a certain way, you know, like why did, why do you hear something? The hairs on your arm stand up. It's like, there's certainly a chemical reason, but you know, is that all there is? I don't know. I don't know. The carpe diem of the aspect or the carpe diem aspect of the album is definitely, uh, I think an important thing for me because I don't, I'm not sure if I believe in another life. And like I said, I don't know. So I do feel like it's important to really capture on the, the idea that, yo, you should be really spending your days the way that you want to. And I feel like obviously I'm coming from a privileged, privileged position, but I do, Right. feel like it's important to spend time with the people that you really care about and, you know, it's, and make things special, like make your days special, make your holidays special, make your, you know, just make things special because it's, it's so important because you never know when it's going to change, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think just what I'm taking from what you're saying too, is the idea of being present for all of it, right? And not sort of just letting time pass you by while you're, you know, For sure. in one routine or stuck in your head or whatever that may be. It's, it's good, man. I mean, it makes me think about the idea of, uh, of legacy too, which is something I like to talk about on here from time to time. Do you, A, do you care about the idea of legacy? Do you think it matters what we leave behind you know, as, as artists and B, uh, do, you know, what do you want to leave behind if anything? Um, I do think it matters cause I still listen to artists that, um, don't make music anymore. I was actually thinking about this, um, the other day cause I made a playlist of a bunch of, um, like I listen to some country every now and then, believe it or not, like, yeah. uh, really, um, more bluegrass, like the really folksy stuff. So yeah. 
Charlie Crockett, Lost Dog Street Band. Um, and it actually all came about from, I'm a big fan of Tiger Army, who um, Nick 13 did like a country album that I really liked. And it kind of got me into exploring some of that. And I put a Marty Robbins song on the the playlist because it's country. And my dad used to sing El Paso all the time, which that track um, I don't know if you know that song El Paso by Marty Robbins, but no, I need to look it up. Um, so he used to sing it by the campfire when I was a kid. And, um, the concept of it is this gunfighter who falls in love with this woman, this young other cowboy comes into town. They're both going after the same woman. He kills the cowboy gets out of town, but he's so in love with her that he comes back and ends up getting shot and he dies. Oh, yeah. And it's like, yeah. you know, this concept of like love eternal or like love where like death is, death is the veil, you know, and right. um, how that ended up connecting all the way to like this album, you know, cause that's definitely a big concept of this album. So it's interesting, you know, to think that musician and his contribution to music my dad used to play those songs by the fire in like, you know, 30 years later, I'm making an album that has to do with that in a way, which is like, yeah, crazy. no, that is, it's fascinating. And it's, there's something very, uh, kind of heartwarming about that too, or comforting in the sense that throughout, you know, different eras of history, different styles of music, different, uh, technology levels, you know, what a million different things that humans were still sort of thinking about the same things, mm -hmm. you know, sure. and that yeah. like, we're, we're not as special or unique as we may think we are, you know, totally. which I guess that sounds negative, but that I weirdly, I find that kind of comforting. Well, I think it's more just like there's concepts that are passed down and stay with us generationally as, um, as artists or not just as artists, but as like storytellers and, they keep getting retold in different ways. And it's, um, it's pretty cool to think about because I'm sure he was inspired by some other story and like indirectly influences art all the way down the line. So I guess when it comes to legacy, I feel like it is important, but we're all just kind of telling the same few stories. And we, I guess we don't even think about it when we're telling them, but yeah, it's like, we're, I think regardless of what we do, we're already in the legacy, you know, it's just this chain of that. Yeah. 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 Just by the act of, of participating in it. That's, uh, I, I talked to Maddie on a while back and we talked a lot about that idea of like, for him, what was really important was just, it's not about sort of how many people know your music or what you think of your artists, that the fact that you're sort of participating in this tradition mm -hmm and in this culture in sort of a broad sense that like that's the real cool part that's the real reward for sure 100 percent. yeah well this has been great man i don't want to i know you're sick i don't want to keep you too long uh i just have a a, a few like kind of quick fire questions just like sure. short little questions yeah. uh just kind of the the first thing you think of cool. uh, and they're just little little random prompts first one here is uh what gives you energy Coffee. Good. Yeah, that's good. I got a little too much of that in me right now. <laughs> I need another one. Is that part of the, the daily routine? Yeah. The coffee thing? Do you do one, like an elaborate coffee. coffee preparation? No, Jason Ross is the, the crazy coffee guy. I'm, I just have one of those little pod machine things. I put the, yeah. Uh, what is it called? Collagen powder in it. So cow powder. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. well. And that's what, that's good for... Skid? What is the collagen oh, for? It's good for your hair and stuff. And right. I've been trying to like gain a little weight. So trying to eat more protein and stuff. Definitely. There's a lot of uh, protein in it. So, uh, all right. Next question. What is the hardest you've worked? I think some of those long flights back and forth, like I was saying, Miami, LA, back to Miami is. There's a, there's downtime when you're flying, but the mental game that yeah. you play to like get yourself up on stage on the third show when you haven't slept is like really, really intense. I'd say that would probably be it. Yeah. Well, and it's gotta be doubly. So when, 
as we talked about earlier, touring isn't even necessarily the most fun part of it for you, right? Yeah, for sure. On the flip side, what makes work fun? Um, Two things. I'd say the reward of making music is just fun. Like, I love that. But the other thing now is like the connection that I get to share with my friends and my family, like getting to make music with Emma and Courtney, getting to make music with like all of my friends. That's amazing. And getting to like play shows with them, like the Pantheon tour where we all got to like, I got to play the mega collab and they would all come out and we would like have fun or just hanging out in the green room. Like those moments yeah. I'd say are definitely make it all worth it for sure. Uh, that's great, man. I was uh, I was talking to the the Glitch Mob guys about the tour they did with you and uh, Nightmare and all that. And they were kind of saying a similar thing where it was like the shows were great and they had a good time, but it was kind of more for them about just the, the people around it. Yep, for sure. Yeah, we had yeah. a good time. Uh, I think we played paintball with Justin once and th- we also did like this, rented out this old haunted um, asylum kind of thing and we stayed there until 3 a.m we're running around it was fun we did some fun stuff on that tour wait did you just rent it out just to like run around in it what, it's, a, what it's a, like a haunted asylum that they like rent out for groups of people to go explore and hang out in and oh okay um, they took us on a tour like a haunted tour of an old asylum yeah. i forgot where it was but it was really cool um, oh, so they great. ended up just letting us run around in there and we all just were trying to scare the shit out of each other. It was pretty funny. Yeah, it sounds awesome. <laughs> um, all right. We kind of covered this. I'm going to X a couple of these. We covered that. Okay. We'll just, we'll skip to the most end open-ended one. Uh, what do you need? What do I need? I've been doing a lot of self-work on not needing anything. Mm. That's where I'm at right now. Uh, That's good. Yeah. Uh, That sounds kind of Buddhist. Yeah. I, like I said, I, I've got to spend a lot of time alone and I think a lot of times in my life, I wasn't comfortable with that, even as an introverted person. And I feel like I've gotten to a point where I think I understand that, you know, learning to not need anything is the only, not the only way, but it is a, a good way to feel peaceful and happy. I love that, man. I mean, I think that's a, that's a pretty good way to, to wrap all of this up. Uh, is there anything else we haven't talked about? Anything else that's on your mind? Anything else you want to get out there? Um, no, I think that was it. It was really good talking to you and yeah, I'm uh, excited for the album to come out. I'm definitely excited and nervous and yeah, I hope all yeah. Goes well. it's a great album. You should be proud of it, man. I really like it. Appreciate that. Great talking to you. Hope to run into you somewhere out there in the world. And uh, yeah, I hope you feel better, man. Definitely. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. Take care. Peace.